Tune in at www.darkcityradio.com. You can find us by searching Dark City Radio on Facebook or Twitter. Good evening, Dark City Radio. Um, it's the Permaculture Show, and this week I wanted to just sort of bring it right back to the the battle application of them. So Bob's here. And we're going to chat about that and the rest of the Dark City crew. So please feel free to jump in and, you know, add your interpretation or, you know, tell me I'm talking shit or <laughs> whatever. So, first of all, the one of the first principles of permaculture is observing. Um, and this really is, is a massive subject in itself. When I started to look at some of the land I wanted to develop, you know, first of all, I looked at the, the bigger picture, really. It's, you know, the, um, the your garden and then the bigger picture of the, the sort of local area. So, obviously, we're in, you know, us in the UK here, we've got a temperate climate. It's a maritime climate. Um, usually, not at the minute, we have shifting air masses, mainly from the west. Um, which brings us rain and generally here um, our growing season will tend to be about seven to eight months although you know that, that's a whole other subject in itself extending growing periods um, so the um, prevailing air mass controls the climatology really um, um, so I'm landlocked here <laughs> Um, and I'm amongst urban conditions, which itself brings a whole different aspect into the microclimate of the area. Birmingham's actually on a plateau here. So, you know, as you start to look at the bigger picture like this, you can kind of build up how your growing conditions are affected and what to put in that will just grow without too much uh, input from yourself. <laughs> so we're, we're quite high above sea level here and our land is sedimentary rock and actually 70% of the Midlands is agricultural um, so the urbanisation is mainly focused on this Birmingham plateau where I am and in contrast to that we've also got 8,000 areas of parkland so when you start to look at your, your area like this, you can build up. It, it's the very basic, basic formulation of a plan, really. So then I went on to look at, obviously, the weather patterns and the rainfall. We get quite heavy rain here. You know, we do get extremes of weather, snow being one of them as well. And then we also get what is called an urban heat island, which is basically a man-made microclimate. So this is the area where most people sort of live and work. And so we get a reduced sky view factor. We get a decrease in long wave radiation and loss radiation tracking. We can get slower wind speeds and decrease in turbulent heat loss on to look at the actual site that I was going to be growing on and built up a picture of what I'd got there so it's surrounded by houses there's a six acre wood one mile away it's three miles to Birmingham where the land rises it's five miles to Dudley where the land rises again um, and I'm also five miles away from Sandwell Valley Park country park so that all helps me to build up a picture of, of what I can grow on my land according to these conditions. So before I even do anything on the allotment then, I look at what I don't need to do. <laughs> if you don't know what to do, do nothing. So I've got this compost heap on my allotment. The council had taken off the top layer, which I think they thought was helpful, but they just dumped it in these three pallet things totally full all full of cooch all full of bramble so I couldn't I couldn't do anything with it and neither could I do anything with the soil that was left because it was compacted and it had become grown over by bramble and cooch so I didn't do anything 
go to the compost heap and it was left there for two seasons and then after that I thought oh well I really need to kind of shift this out and um, when I when I went to um, start digging it out it was full of worms and I was really amazed and I, I couldn't realise how these worms had got in there but then in, I realised in the allotment next to me there's a big um, and the compost, all, all the cooch and bramble had dried out through the time and then all the leaves had been taken into the compost heap. So it was actually really, really beautiful soil. So, this is amazing. And that's just from literally doing nothing. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, this is all still observation. You know, they say that you should observe a site every year before you do anything on it. Um, and have a look at where your frost pockets are, where the heat is trapped, um, where the sun falls throughout the year. And then as you take all this information down, you're building up an even better picture of what is suited to your site. So the next thing you would look at is um, indicator plants, so the plants that are growing there already, um, and that gives you an idea of what your soil um, is like. So we had um, dandelions on there and we had cooch grass on there. Um, we've got nettles on there, which tells you that we've got rich soil. Nairisa, are you there, hon? It looks like Nairisa's dropped off for the moment. She does have a very bad connection, so we do have to bear with her. Um, I'm sure she's chattering away in the background about how nettles are apparently a really good indicator that you've got good, rich soil. Uh, and not only that, you can eat them and you can also use them as a kind of uh, green mulch on your land as well if you need to uh, introduce some nutrients to your land. And also you can make uh, rope and things from nettles as well. That's something else that people haven't looked at because they've got very strong fibres and paper is, is another thing that nettles are great for. Well, these are the, some of the skills that we actually need to relearn. So, have you got any idea how we go about making paper from nettles? Uh, well, paper shouldn't be too difficult. What you basically do um, is you ret them. Ret means to, to rot them. So, you put them in a, um, in a big tub of, tub of water mm. and everything kind of rots off them except for the for the fibre, and then you can use that fibre the same as you do. Oh, okay. And it looks like we've got Maurice back, and we, and we might have Bob Earthwise back. <laughs> Hi, yeah. are you both back? Yes, I'm back. Cool. Take it away. <laughs> yes, I wasn't rambling too much then, was I? <laughs> you were sounding good to us, Maurice. Oh, good. I quite like the idea of everyone having a buzzer, so if I start rambling. <laughs> so, uh -uh. Right, so where to get to? Soil indicator plants, yes. Yeah. So um, I also had clover on there, which told me it was um, a nitrogen fixer. Um, bramble, which tells me rich soil. So building up a picture of, of what, what it's like. So then we take some soil samples, you know, and really start to think about what soil fertility is. It's quite an interesting question, actually. I wonder if anyone else has got this is my uh, definition of soil it's the support system that enables life from below the ground to grow and flourish above the ground it is part of an ecosystem that sustains and draws benefit from many genetically diverse species has anyone else got a definition of soil fertility Bob, Bob? no that sounds perfectly good to me um, the more diverse the soil, the greater the soil's ability to support life. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing. It's really, I suppose, because you're emulating nature, it's just starting that happening. Because like I was saying there with the compost heap, it was amazing because so the leaves fell in and then the worms just came, you know, and that was like, Permaculture without permaculture, <laughs> it just happens, <laughs> and I observed it. <laughs> it well, the really is, perma permaculture um, is just trying its very best to replicate nature. 
in in I mean, na nature is the highest authority in permaculture. So when something happens as of its own accord, that's exactly what permaculture is. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I've got this. It's only a tiny little bed. It's only probably in my back garden, about two meters by six meters. But I've been working on it for years now, and the soil is so nice. I've only ever mulched it. I've never dug it, and that just has naturally clover coming through, um, and also um, viola, which is edible. So, what, uh, what color um, clover? Uh, it's white. White? Mm, mm. Yeah, brilliant. That's the indigenous yeah. one. Oh, and the, the whole of the countryside is polluted with purple clover. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realise that the um, purple. Where is it from, Bob? Which, the purple clover? I'm not sure, but I think it's American. Yeah. And it's supposed to stick more nitrogen than our own native clover. But on the other hand, it's more invasive. Yeah, so they, they serve as the ground cover now, and they've pretty much, you know, colonised the bed. So I've got a fig tree in there as well. So they just sit happily. With that I've got some primroses in there. It's a really um I don't know, I don't suppose it's strictly permaculture because a lot of it's been instinctive as to what to put in when to create a little happy kind of system. So there's a, a little niche plant in there. Um for everything, you know, I mean I've got obviously the dandelions um have got a really deep root. So um, they're good for sort of breaking up the soil and getting more nutrients brought up. Um, and I've just put, I hope they germinate, some um, wild garlic seeds in there. So, is your... Ramsons? Yes, Ramsons. Is, your, your, is it up by you now? Probably is, isn't it? Sorry? Is, is the wild garlic up now? Your it's way. just, yeah, it's just coming. It's an early plant. Um, mm. Outside the front of where I live, I have tricorn leeks, which are very similar. Mm. It's identical flowers, it's just the leaves that are different. Mm. But yeah, they're, they're an early thing. Yeah. It's they come up with the bluebells and the snowdrops. Mm, I, I seem to come up um, a little bit later here. Um, I'm not sure why. We are in a bit of a dip. It might be because of that. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so yeah. So um, going back to sort of looking looking at your land and building up this picture, um, uh, a soil assessment is is the next thing. So. Um, Side from looking at the plants on the top, um, we do like um, I don't know if you've used this one, Bob, uh, like a double spade method. So you dig down with the spade, but then you actually dig out a trench, so you don't actually compact any of the soil yourself. So you can get it out in one nice big piece and start having a look at it, and um, then you can really look at the structure of it and see if it's sort of compacted anywhere see how many stones are in there and uh, see um, how many earthworms are in there or any other sort of life um, and then sort of really start to have a look at the soil itself um, so you can have a look to see if it's got how much organic matter it's got in there um, if you well, basically, the best way to do it is get some and then spit in it and then squidge it yeah. up. And <laughs> There's a lot of spit involved in permaculture. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and mud. That's why I like it. <laughs> Just love mud, really. I mean, in, basically, with soils, I mean, on a, on a very simple level, 
you know, what's your water like? You know, is it hard or soft? And if it's soft water, likely you're going to have an acid soil. And if it's hard water, likely you're going to have a, an alkali soil. You know, hard water comes from chalk, so... Yeah, there's that test you can do as well, isn't there? I haven't tried it myself. Have you? I'm going to get this the wrong way around now. So if you put vinegar in your soil and it foams, then it's alkali. And if you put that's correct. bicarb in your soil and it foams, then it's acid. That, that's, that's correct. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's good. That's just what I mean, it's, you know these things you can actually do where gardening well, that, that, that's something. a good thing that people could try isn't it really yeah exactly exactly no, yeah. It's, it's simple and it's stuff you've got in the cupboard at home mm, mm. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe they can you know email in all their different all their different soil types yeah fantastic yeah that'd be really cool i mean that's the other thing i like about permaculture that it is constant research and yeah, but I bet, you never, I bet you never thought it would turn into a phone party, though. <laughs> oh, no. Scary. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've lost my train of thought now. You've excited me. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> um, no, it's important to know what sort of soil you got. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Well, and, you know, it's, I'd say it is just common sense, isn't it? Because as you build these pictures up, then you're more likely to put something in place that's actually going to work and sort of foresee, um, you know, any kind of problems and, you know, sort of eliminate them by already having it all set in place. Um, well, the, the other thing, of course, is the plants will tell you. You know, if you if you put an acid loving plant into an area that's alkali, it, it will look very unhappy. Mm. Mm. You know, so when you're growing stuff, keep an eye on it. You know, does it look right? Mm. If it always looks unhappy, it shouldn't be there. Definitely. Well, I think it's always nice to kind of take that time. I mean, I do regularly. Just, I mean, I've only got a tiny garden go around and have a little stroll see how how well everything's getting on <laughs> well all, all, all the plants need to communicate with you you know they're they're there because you've invited them into your space you know you're their guardian if you like mm, mm. yeah and they know it you know and they know that you're there looking after them so they're going to communicate with you you know that's what you know we have dmt for Mm, mm. You know, well, all the plants have got it, we've got it, and that's how nature communicates. Yeah, well, that's what I was saying earlier about, you know, when you do start to kind of study the space around you like this for, you know, um, it gives you a great sense of um, place, you know, and it kind of does um, really bring you present. And like I was saying earlier, you know, listening to Sarah and everyone talking about grounding, and I was wondering how I grounded myself <laughs> or if indeed I did <laughs> and then I realised through pondering on this today that this is how I ground myself by thinking about the you know environment like that so uh, yeah that's a bit of a revelation for me earlier <laughs> um, so yeah and I think the only the sort of other thing to think about um, soil wise really is um you know, uh, if you're in an urban environment, it can be contaminated. Um, I think I'm just trying to um, get the council now to test the soil on our allotments because uh, the area we're in is massively industrial. So um, it probably is contaminated. <laughs> well, I think you'll find that they should have that on record. Oh, well, yeah. Apparently they don't, but I mean, you know what, that I mean, the, I know it has been in a lot, as far as I can find out, it's been in allotment at least um, the war, the, the German wars, um, 
Well, since the Second World War. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So it all goes a bit vague. I mean, it's amazing how vague the council can be, considering how much paperwork <laughs> they do, isn't it? <laughs> They've got yeah. loads of paperwork, but they never know anything. <laughs> exactly. We're finding this out more and more, and it's, you know, across the country, all these councils have, over the years, learned how to become very devious. Yeah, well... I mean, this thing, you know, we've been trying to get this, well, someone had set up a community interest company for our allotment, and um, there was loads of stuff going on, and I don't know if I mentioned to you before, um, I went to a meeting with the council, and um, they told me they didn't know what permaculture was, and then told me that you couldn't permaculture an allotment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I've been pondering on it, I, I sent some links of large-scale permaculture projects, I sent her an email saying I was concerned. <laughs> it had been bothering me that she didn't think you could permaculture an allotment. So I sent her some permaculture links. But she sent me quite a nice email back saying, you know, they'd be happy to develop an allotment along permaculture principles. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were about to say they sent a, a letter back saying they were going to ban nature. <laughs> No, I, no nature in our allotments. You have to buy all your seed from Monsanto. <laughs> well, that is a point worth um, mentioning as well, though. You know, um, there are some kind of trials of um, being practicing permaculture on allotments because other allotment holders don't necessarily like it, do they? <laughs> well, no. Yeah, I mean it's it's being able to explain the actually snails and slugs do have a part to play mm -hmm. and what you need to do is to give them a plants that they like to eat that you are prepared to sacrifice and be encouraging in other animals that will control them you know that's what permaculture is it's the balance between everything you know definitely yeah um well, I do know some people that have been chucked off allotment sites for it, but yeah, you're right, it's, it's all down to how you communicate it. For refusing to use slug pellets? Um, well, no, I think it's more the, um, you know, if, if people are mulching and obviously, um, really, when you're trying to get going, you, you just chuck whatever you've got down on the ground to cover it to start with, you know, and it's from a an unsightly point of view um, the people I've spoke to it's things like dandelions isn't it because I wouldn't dig up dandelions but then it's the, uh, the seed dispersal thing as well, <laughs> well Although it's weird. the trick is not to allow it to get to that point isn't it mm. so if, mm. if you're encouraging dandelions make sure that you pick the flowers yeah, I have started um, making a syrup from dandelion flowers. Actually. I mean, they're perennials anyway, so mm, mm. the fact and I that you, they won't have um, seeded is pretty irrelevant with dandelions. Mm, mm. Well, they're, they're kind of a perfect crop in a way because, I mean, if you dig up roots as well, You disappeared again, Norris. Obviously, you wouldn't eradicate them completely. They're like potatoes in that way, I suppose. They just keep growing. So, so you kind of keep a nice little cycle going on, don't you, really? No, it's the same um, with nettles. Mm, mm. Yeah. Um, again, that's... Um, well, it is. It's, you see, it's... Look at observing you look Nerese gone again. Yeah, Nerese has. Um <clears throat> getting back to the nettles bit. We were talking about nettles. Yeah. And they're they're a really, really beneficial weed that most people hate in their gardens. And and for two very good reasons. Um Firstly, 
they have way more nutrients than spinach does and taste very similar and of course where you have a nettle boundary people are less likely to want to wade through it so you know a lot of these plants are good security plants as well and we need to think very carefully about what we try to eradicate because often what we put in in its place is very invasive you know take rhododendrons i'm particularly here in dorset they're rampant through our woodland and then you know all sorts of other invasive plants that have been brought over but we should really look after the ones that love to deliver definitely well we'll be celebrating the nettle this year we've just started uh, we've been dying for the nettles to come through so we can start making soup we're actually also looking at um making a kind of a you know you see all these superfood everyone's talking about these superfoods now so we're going to make like um we're going to dry some nettle and then mix it with some other stuff that we know will just grow well that he's already growing i've got lots of uh, marjoram and thyme um oh actually you i don't know if anyone can help right because we've, we've got this recipe and all of that you know we've got available locally and there's just one well, sounds like Nairis has disappeared, but um, one good thing to try would be nettle beer. There's a little micro brewery fairly close to where I live, and they do a nettle beer in the spring. And it is the most bright green beer you've ever seen. But the taste is absolutely delicious. So I recommend nettle beer. Am I back on? Can you hear me? I can now. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, I don't know if you caught that, yeah. Our uh, superfood mix that we're going to make up with nettles and some other sort of locally grown stuff, like a real just sort of full of nutrient kind of thing that you can put in stews or on salads. We were looking today, though, because the recipe we've got contains dulse. Do you know much about seaweed? Only that it, there's a lot of it near where I live. I oh, see, it's perfect for you, but we're, we're landlocked. Um, we were trying to think of an alternative, but we couldn't really think of one because obviously it's kind of the sodium content and the calcium content that's, um, that's why it's in there and we couldn't think of a kind of land plant alternative. I don't think there would be one really, would there? Well, there must be. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret that not many people know. Um, there are only two species on the planet that have THC receptors mm. in their brains. Mm. And of course, you know, we all know that man is one. Mm. And the other one is sea urchins. Mm. So there must be an equivalent in the ocean to everything that there is on land and and that kind of makes sense being that all life came from the ocean anyway yeah and it's you know far bigger space than the land that we all occupy so i think that it would be good logic that there would be way more there than we even know about already yeah that's really interesting. I suppose I've, I've never pondered really on the uh, ecosystems of the sea so much because I'm uh, inland. <laughs> so I've pondered more on forests than seas. That's really interesting. I have to think about but That's that. where we came from, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Originally, of course, no, it makes yeah. total sense. Mm, yeah, but, yeah well, I've spent a lot of time. I was quite surprised that, you know, there was a big connection between man and sea urchins. I can't find one that will give me a deal, though. <laughs> Typical. Have you never heard? Sea urchins are always tight. Have you never heard? No. <laughs> <laughs> 
Good, I'm glad you got on to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Never trust the sea urchin. <laughs> <laughs> Just turtle. <laughs> um, yeah, it's always wet. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, go, going back to kind of building up this picture. So that, that's kind of all the information, really, we're sort of looking at on sites. I sort of didn't mention, really, that we... Well, we, we have talked about it in a roundabout way that we kind of harvested as we went really on these sites and used what we could um, for, you know, what its use were. And as you say, everything pretty much has a use. I've, I haven't tried yet, but I'd really like to try. Um, one of the members of the permaculture group was saying years ago they used to use um, bramble for weaving and they'd use like um, a tin can and put, oh, put a little hole in and then pull the bramble through to get all the spines off. And then if you think about it, it's an amazing kind of really pliable thing, isn't it? That you could really, you know, make cool stuff with. Um, you haven't tried I've, that? I've not heard of that at all before. No, I think it's... Um, <clears throat> I think it was an old family member she heard it from, yeah. It was just obviously something, you know... I, I yeah. think it's get your own back on Bramble time. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a vision of pulling it through a can and seeing all the the prickled things that give you hell normally just pinging off into the distance. I know, I know. They are, aside from nettles, though, they are my other... Oh, I eat nettles. I get my own back. <laughs> That's really easy. I know, but I think brambles. <clears throat> I've probably whittled away about brambles before. They're just amazing because, again, they're just so. You know, their will to grow is just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and you know, and you need to harness the energy in plants like that. Mm, mm. And I mean the one. Um, got in the back garden I've seen it you know parts of it will get rust but they'll just die off yeah and the rest of it's fine it can be yeah. covered in aphids and still have loads of fruit it well but it's all the same as what we've been saying well that invites but, the ladybirds in and, mm-hmm. you know, and the birds. The, yeah exactly exactly this is what permaculture is Mm, it's mm. making sure there's an environment where everything can survive. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll... live in abundance. That's mm-hmm. the key. You know, everything in abundance. Well, I, I kind of got this theory because when the council took off the top layer of the allotment, that's what, grew, you know, pooch grew back, obviously, and brambles. You know, they're kind of, they're almost like... Um, the earth, putting like a, a, a chain on the top of itself, sort of saying, leave me alone. <laughs> You've ravaged me and that you should just leave me alone because, you know, you couldn't do anything with it. And it was, it was almost like it was sort of telling you that, you know. So, yeah, nature is amazing. So, so yeah, anyway, from that, I um, drew up some, what's called a base map. So that will mm. usually have all that information on that we talked about there, you know. Um, so you can kind of build up a really good picture of what you've got to work with. And then you can have on there um, the gradient of your land. That's obviously another quite important thing. My allotment is at the top of a slight gradient, unfortunately, although it is on a flat itself. So the soil dries out quite quickly on the top. Um, where we're building the forest garden is the opposite because that's at the bottom of a gradient. So that gets lots of nutrients because they're all um, washed off down to that area. Um, so, and then is the really good bit because that's what's overwhelming, especially if you take on an allotment or a larger piece of land of just, oh, now what do I do with it? <laughs> and and it, it, if you've got sea urchins, watch out because that's a whole different... Yeah, then you re- yeah, you really need to look to- at. Yeah, they dry out but only at high tide. And- <laughs> yeah, although actually my next They're door after neighbor- you weave at the end of the day. <laughs> my my next door neighbour's got a bath that he's put out in his front garden. He had a new bathroom over in the young and around. See if I'm gonna bury it up the allotment. 
have little family of sea urchins up there. Yeah. <laughs> I could find my own dogs then as well. Oh, yeah. I feel a plan coming together. Yeah. <laughs> it might be too labour intensive, I don't know. Yeah. I'll have to do a spider diagram to work it out. <laughs> I've just been told there's no sea urchins in Japan anymore because they've eaten them. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, they do. Well, I don't like... I can't eat... Oh. I can't eat them. I don't like fish. I can't eat any kind of fish. It's weird, isn't it? I think I might have lived in Iceland in a previous life and eaten a lifetime of fish because uh, now I can't. It's really weird. I can't eat it. Oh. Anyway, it's the random, <laughs> random Well, operation. yeah, I, I was just thinking how you'd get on with aquaponics then. Well, I mean, I have looked after fish and we did used to have a tank and I used to, um, just a little tank and I used to, um, you know, rinse out the sponge and feed the plants with that. That that was okay. Um, but it's, um, no. That's not fish for food though, is it? No, I couldn't, no, I couldn't, um... Eat, eat fish from a system, an aquaponic system, no. Um, it's really strange. I can't smell fish or touch it. It's really weird. I don't know what it is. And I've, tr I've tried. <laughs> I've tried. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there you go. So, <clears throat> apparently you can eat snakes. So are, you, are you vegetarian then? No, I'm not vegetarian, no. I don't oh. eat a massive amount of meat. I have been pondering on it recently whether I should I have been before um, but obviously issues with me to just getting worse and worse well for what it's worth when you're man you eat things that are living or have lived mm. and it doesn't matter what type of species it is it lived so all the people that get upset for one reason or another need to think about that. Mm, mm. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and as man, we share at least 80% of the same DNA of everything else that lives. Mm, mm. Everything else, 80%. Oh, it's quite scary. So it's all no, it's cannibalism. Not scary. No, it's not what I mean, scary. theoretically, it's all cannibalism. Then, isn't it really? <laughs> Whoa, I wouldn't quite <laughs> put it to that extreme. <laughs> but you know, if, if if you don't like to eat living things, what are you going to do? Eat rocks. Yeah, and um, uh, no, I mean, I think really, if if you eat meat, you should, you've got to be prepared to kill the animal yourself, haven't you? Really? I Boy. think that you need to be in a position where you can graciously accept the life that you're about to consume, mm. Mm. and that applies, you know, whether it's you know a mammal or a fish or a reptile or a plant i mean really there's no difference is it no no not at all no yeah if you go and buy a bag of alive in the same way that they were in the ground admittedly they can regenerate from that bag which of course if you go and buy a a chicken, if you stick that in the ground, it won't. Mm. Yeah, there is a difference there. However, you know, pe people seem to like to draw a difference between one form of life and another. And in fact, if you think that a potato can regenerate, mm. even from a bag in a supermarket, if you then stick it in boiling water, that's kind of the same as lobsters and crabs, isn't it? Well, yeah. They have eyes as well. They, <laughs> they do, yeah. You know, they do. So, come on, I don't eat anything with eyes. 
<laughs> yeah. So that's that's blown mind a bit now. That's another yeah. thing I'll have to ponder on. <laughs> well, the thing is, everything we eat either is or was a lie. Everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't eat stuff that never was. Well, you can. I mean, you can sit and eat carbon if you want. Yeah, munch on bits of charcoal. Oops. Uh, and I guess, you know, a bit of Himalayan salt, that would do you good. But you couldn't survive on it. No. You could. So, so you're, you're not vegetarian then? No, I, I'm part of nature. Mm. Mm. You know, if I was supposed to be a vegetarian, I would have eyes on the side of my head and my teeth would keep growing. Mm. As it is, so I have to pay out a fortune in dentist bills because I only get one set. <laughs> and my eyes look false, usually. Uh. No, well, we, I mean, we have got um, a local butcher, so, um, you know, I'm pretty lucky there. He's, um, oh, they're invaluable. Mm, mm, the meat. Yeah, you know, all the stuff you get in supermarkets, you know, if you do eat meat, it's very difficult to trust. Mm, mm. If you've got a good butcher, you know, in your local town or village, use him. Yeah. Use him. Yeah. Because his knowledge is invaluable. Oh, they're great. He's great, honestly. Um, you know, if you could get an honest butcher, God, it uh, certainly goes a long way. <laughs> I know he was telling me that he knows of other butchers that will um, buy turkeys in June when they're, like, dirt cheap and then freeze them and then defrost them and sell them as fresh at Christmas, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty awful and that's probably that's just scratching the surface of the meat world isn't there there's a lot more horrific goings on goings on than that <laughs> well it applies to the whole corporate world it doesn't matter whether it's food or anything else pharmaceuticals mm. they're all as bad as each other and, and this is you know <laughs> the major problems that we're facing and this is what permaculture tries to address yeah definitely well yeah that's the other I know I've talked about it before but seeds was the other thing I wanted to mention again because I've been pondering on that today and um I just think it's so important for people to um you know start seed banks and I mean and, you know, starting a seed bank isn't anything. Just get a box, a bag, and tell everyone you're doing it. And it's amazing, you know, especially if you already know other gardeners, that how people will just come and start putting seeds in and, you know, kind of you start to build up this little local seed bank. Um, and hopefully, eventually, it'll all be heritage seeds. But I just want to get the concept going for people, really. And they are. They're into it. And, We've been doing it, and anyone can do it. It's so important now. It's so important to be in ownership of your own food. Well, the, the key thing with seed banks, of course, is to think about it at the other end of the summer. Mm. You know, mm. because right now, most people don't have any. No, so, no. So, you know, what are they going to do? You know, how are they going to... I mean, from my point of view, I think growing herbs is one of the favourite things. No, I mean, it's, I, was, I was just trying to say that one of the key things to do is to, is to grow herbs. Mm, mm. I mean, they're one of the, the most medicinal plants that we have, and really simple ones like thyme and rosemary, sage. Mm. They all grow here really easily. They're native, um, and, okay. and some of the more Mediterranean ones, oregano, 
et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and people are putting into chat ginger. We can grow ginger here and chili. Mm. And all of these things are really beneficial. And and they love to grow for you as well. You know, if you put one in and you put a little bit of energy, it will reward you ten times. And and you'll feel it. It's the DMT. Because we've just got so much of that, so we may Well, I can't hear you again, Norris kind of observation <laughs> that that's really the kind of things you want to be taking into account um i've got all these details of how i built up this picture of our site and loads of resources in a dropbox file if anyone wants access to it oh, there's a load of ebooks and all sorts in there and growing calendars and those things about testing your soil i think there's um a thing on there that tells you it's a soil texture test that tells you how you can work out what sort of soil you've got. So um, you can friend me on Facebook, Larice, um, or join the Perm Sandwell and Birmingham Permaculture Group and then email me and I can send you an invite if anyone wants to join on to that. Um, put, put, all I'll, the, put all the info under the podcast. Yeah, oh yeah, good idea. I keep forgetting <laughs> about that type of thing. And it relates yeah, yeah. to what that, people have listened to. It's cool. Yeah, I can put those links under there. Um, and yeah, I suppose maybe we can. Um, I'm not sure what's uh, if we'll have another guest on next week. It was all weird. Weird things have happened this week, and then what happened was my throat chakra really opened up, <laughs> and <laughs> it, had been, it had been really closed for ages. And then I just suddenly thought. I've got I've got things that I need to say this week, so and that was it, pretty much. This is um, Dark City Radio. <laughs> um, yeah, so I suppose maybe next week see I'll see who we get on as a guest. I have been chatting to some people, someone about new energy, and a few other people, but it'd be good to talk a bit more about design because kind of I think really we talked up to the stage there where oh we've only got three minutes talked up to the stage where you make a base map so we can um, speed up quick <laughs> we can carry on with that next week can't we bob i'll be happy to join you again Maurice. i Fantastic. enjoyed this evening thank you yeah. it was really really good lovely to speak to you and um, yeah we'll do some more next week yeah and, and grow to survive <laughs> exactly keep planting the seeds <laughs> All right then. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, Dark City guys. Hello, um, Maurice. You've got you've got three minutes left. Could you just quickly oh. say about how, how you can tell the difference in the soils? Um, you know, you've got enough time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you mean sort of um, basically when I was talking about getting a ball? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so you take a little ball of soil. Then um, I mean, obviously, if it's really wet, you don't need to spit in it. But generally you will need to put a bit of moisture in there so spit into it and then squeeze it up um, and then have a look see if it's in you know how much organic matter it's got in there if it's quite a lot then you're sort of working with peat um, if you haven't you can have a look see if it's predominantly sandy and obviously there'll be the little grains there you'll be able to see um, if it will make a stable ball then it's sandy loam if it won't then it's just predominantly sand um, if it's silky or buttery and easy to squash um, then it's silt or silty loam if it's hard to squash or if you rub it and it sort of makes a polish or a matte finish if it's no hang on if it's a polish then it's clay if it's a matte finish then it's clay loam um, it sounds quite complicated that sort of descriptions in in the um dropbox file so you can have a look at it and from looking sounds a bit like i'm supposed to tell that but start having a little look and um you know you'll be able to kind of get a feel for it and start to see what what you got to work with and then yeah you start looking in plants to suit or you know um what you might need to add to the soil to improve the structure obviously with clay you're going to want to add some lighter stuff in there get some um uh looser structure um and yeah 
that's uh, that's pretty much how you do it. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. There's a lot to learn, I can see. There, there um, is, there is, but I, hopefully I've broke it down a little bit tonight because I just, you know, I think sometimes it can seem intimidating when it's not. The best way to learn is to do it, you know, just, just do it. And, and that, that's how you learn. And then as soon as you start doing it, you research it as well so you can talk to other pe people and you know give them feedback on what they're doing and they give you feedback on what you're doing and sometimes they go don't do it like that that's stupid <laughs> and then you do it another way you know so uh, yeah yeah it's the oral tradition the last oral tradition <laughs> Right then, I think that's it now. Yeah, we're just about out of time. So, thanks for thanks listening. Catch you later. <laughs> thanks, guys.